Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to talk about life after loss as a square one proposition. For 14 years, I've been the director and a co-founder of the Children's Bereavement Center and have worked with thousands of children and family members who have dealt with life after loss. As director of the Children's Bereavement Center, I witness others who are brought back to square one every day. Sometimes it's a child who loses a parent or a child who loses a brother or sister. Other times it's a parent who may lose a child, whether it's the loss of a grandparent, a brother, a sister, a friend, a gr it doesn't matter. All of these are square one propositions. For those who grieve alone, especially children without support, the outcome is precarious. They may struggle through their lives and really always search for meaning and feel scared and helpless. But I'd like to talk to you about kids and families who I've worked with who are navigating through life with others and other community of grievers have grown to develop resilience, wisdom, confidence, and hope for the future. Loss is very personal to me. When I was 30 years, when I was 33 years old, I lost my brother, three years my junior. My brother, Alan, suffered for two years from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. At the time, it was a real struggle for my family. And while he rallied for all that time, eventually, after a two-year period, he died. And at that time, it was, it was incredible to see how my parents, who had rallied all that time, now look defeated and broken. But my sister and I, we supported them. And we worked with one another, helping each other get through those difficult times. It never occurred to me what that whole experience would mean, either to my life or to my work. People often ask me if my work is depressing. And I have to tell you, I do hear the most horrible stories. But I get to watch people every day who, uh, who find themselves again and really find hope and healing. And that is incredibly inspirational and joyful. I want to tell you about a family that I worked with back in 2002. They came to the center and they have kept in touch with us over the years. It's really been a wonderful experience knowing them. Desna and Kenny Johnson. And they, I talked to them about sharing their story and they were delighted that we do this. Desna, when she was only eight years old, came to us with two broken arms. Her father was robot-like. They had just been through a horrific loss. Her mom, Margie, her grandmother, Martha, and her little brother, Matthew, only six months old, were all killed in a car accident. Desna was the only survivor. While, Danny De while Kenny appeared really traumatized after his loss, it was, it was Desna who came to us looking cheerful and bubbly. Their assumptive world had been shattered. Their equilibrium was totally off. And we knew at that time that their futures were precarious. But Kenny and Desna came to us, and we, they understood at that time that they were here to be helped. Life, when after a loss, actually, we go, after a loss, everything is impacted. It's our, our, our whole emotional world is turned upside down. We know that our cognitive world, our emotional, our physical, and our social world are changed. De Kenny was pulling inward. It took every ounce of, of his being just to survive. But he came religiously to group, bringing his daughter every week. Ke and Desna actually had the opposite reaction. She was cheerful and bubbly. She just exuded energy. She was doing everything she could to focus her dad on her. And this must have been exhausting. The only time she ever appeared to relax was when she was in the group with the other kids. And that's where 
she really felt comfortable. Children often are caregivers after loss. This happens because they know that they're worried about their parents, just as their parents are worried about them. And it's really not unusual at all. One of the things that we see, even in kids who have never experienced loss, is that they will be all often worried, what will happen to me if something happens to my parents? I know my nephew Ari, who is now in medical school, when he was 10 years old, he asked my sister that very question. And he said, what would happen to me? Where will I live if something happens to you and dad? And she told him, you'll go live with your Aunt Mindy and Uncle Jim. And he thought about it for a minute, and then he said, can I go now? <laughs> what we do for our kids every year um, around holiday time is we have a memorial candle lighting. And that's an opportunity for the kids to share pictures and memorabilia with us and to let tell their stories about the person who died. Desna shared pictures of her family. And she pi shared pictures when her baby brother was born. And she told us stories about her baby brother, Matthew, and how she loved to see him every morning when she got up and played with him. And that's one of the things that she missed the most. We've had other children bring pictures and, and memorabilia, too. One little girl brought her, her sister's christening dress in. She had just lost her baby sister and brought pictures of her and her family and her sister to show us. Uh, two other children came in, and they brought pictures of their, of their dad on a motorcycle. He had died in a motorcycle accident, and they had a big poster of him with his motorcycle and with race cars. How many people here, by a show of hands, use, have some object that they keep with them that's very important to them from somebody who died? Or maybe you keep it at home. I know I do. And think of how important those objects are to us. We understand that those objects are connectors for our kids. One little boy told us, and he was 12 years old, Danny, he told us that his mom had saved his dad's watch for him and that he was keeping that for when he grew up. And he said, but you know what I really wanted? I wanted my bl dad's blue jeans. So we know that these objects don't have to be of real value. They just have to have personal value to us. I have to tell you, there's no moving on and there's no resolution after loss. That's one thing I've learned from the families I've worked with. Instead, we integrate the loss, and this grief becomes an adjustment process for us. It becomes part of what we think, we feel, and how we perceive the world. We often say that the person may be gone, but the relationship goes on. One woman in a group told us after her husband died that every week she gardens in her garden, and she talks to him while she gardens. And she said, you know, he's really a much better listener than he used to be. <laughs> Our kids make sense of what happened to them by retelling their stories over and over and over again. And by reformulating their stories, they're actually evolving. It keeps their memories alive. And by talking about it in front of a group of people, it becomes very powerful for them. Grieving alone in a room, grieving alone is like being in a room blindfolded without walls. It's a very scary situation. But the group serves as a barometer. It gives people a chance to look back at where they were, where they are now, and where they may be going. And the group is perceived as another family. Kids feel safe and comfortable in a group. To quote Desna, I felt instantly comfortable being with other kids who knew how I was feeling and the hurt that I was going through. Grief and adjustment go hand in hand. We take turns feeling what we're feeling and adjusting to all the changes in our life as a result of grief. After loss, things change. Maybe the woman who was a couple is now a single person and a single parent. 
And the kids often ask us, am I still a big sister or a big brother? Kenny and, Je and Desna talked about those logistical challenges with me. Kenny remembered having to learn to braid her hair. And now he had to make her dinner. And he had to plan all her after-school activities. But he said what really put him over the edge was having to take her bra shopping when she turned 12. <laughs> Desna talked about having to become closer to her dad and making her dad the confidant and the advisor that her mom had always been to her. She realized at eight years old that she would have to reword her talks and make them more palatable for her dad in the beginning until their bond grew closer and he understood what she was thinking and feeling. That's pretty remarkable for, a 12 year, for an eight-year-old. The support group is viewed as a resource. People come to group and it's kind of like a poo-poo platter. Everybody throws out their ideas, their suggestions, and what they think people should do, and of course, what they've been through. And we get to pick and choose what works for us and what validates what we're feeling. There's some truisms we've learned in working for, with people who have had, had loss. Not one is that we cannot fix what happened, even if we want to. And we cannot alter a person's grief. Grief is a function of the relationship that you have with the person, your own history, your personalities, and how the person died. There are no stages of loss. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about stages of people dying. She never intended for that to be used to talk about people who were grieving. Instead, what's really described to us is more of a roller coaster, that you can feel anything or everything in any given day. And initially, when loss happens, the ride is very rough and you better hold on tight. There are generally two paths for children to follow. Without support or camaraderie and information, you can be left to grieve alone and feel insecure and very vulnerable. You can feel helpless, and for many kids, this undermines their social and emotional development. Alternatively, I'd like to quote Desna again. I didn't feel like a kid anymore. I had to think about more important things than, than my friends did. I still played and had fun like the other kids, but I worried a lot about my dad and how to help him be happy again. Desna is an example of a child who's, had, who's grown in wisdom, maturity, and empathy. And we've seen this kind of positive growth in a lot of the kids who've attended the center. I'd like to tell you about Desna and Kenny today. Two years after they attended the center, they moved up north. They settled in Baltimore. She trained in gymnastics and won a lot of medals and sent us a lot of pictures. Throughout her school career, she, co she competed in pageants. And Desna has recently been awarded the title of Miss Teen Maryland, and she's going to national competition. She's recently graduated from high school and attends Chuan University in North Car Carolina, where she's become a cheerleader. And this really is no surprise to us. Her plan is to become a grief counselor and to work with kids. My journey was certainly inspired by my brother and continues to be inspired by those we serve every day at the Children's Bereavement Center. I found grief to be a transformative process. It may bring us back to square one, but given the support and caring and the opportunity to be validated by others who are going through a similar experience, we may come to become, grow to become wiser, more mature, more empathetic, and with a greater appreciation for life and the people that we love. Thank you.